All right. Let me officially open the meeting. Um, has everybody <coughs> studied the minutes from last meeting? <coughs> we approve those. Yes. Do you want a motion? Yes. I'll make a motion that we accept the October 19, 2020 minutes, meeting minutes as presented. Second? Uh, this bill, I'll second that. Yeah. Any, any corrections or any discussion of any kind? I didn't see any. All in favor? Mayor Curtis, says aye. 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 Okay, good. That's, that's good. Thank you. So let's uh, let's do the uh, orders right now, and then we will move on to uh, the treasurer, town treasurer. So, oh boy, uh, yeah. You want a motion, Gordon? Yes. <coughs> yes. Here we I move that we approve the warrants as presented. Uh, I'll, I'll second it. Were there any uh, any questions on anything? No. Hey, uh, I have a question on the um, the records conservation. Um, I'm not sure who the vendor is. Um, and it's all obviously coming out of the general town budget, but this is the clerk's activity. I, I missed the last part. Say that again, Phil. Whose activity? Who's conserving what records? Uh, so that is uh, going on in the clerk's office. Uh, they're digitizing the records. Uh, two things. I believe that there is a reserve fund that he's drawing from, uh, not the, the general fund. And there's also a grant involved, which will be uh, reimbursable once the project's done okay. and um, that'll you'll need to submit once the project's done and then um, we should get grant reimbursed I believe it's 100 percent on the project okay huh? and, and as I understand it they're actually digitizing them and I'm not sure if they're creating a database but um, hopefully they are um, good thank you yeah, I have a that's... question I was just going to say that's um, kind of an ongoing project. I think this isn't yeah. the first time. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Dave, I saw the the <laughs> money for the tra um, what is it? The tractor. Did you did we get it, or you just have to order it? Um, I believe we're about a week out on that. So we generally have to have a check ready to go when uh, once it's produced. So instead of you know, trying to cut one midweek or or having you come in special. Um, we wrote the check for for have you guys sign up on it tonight. Um, okay. But I think we're about a week away from that coming in. Well, it's so good it, timing. It's yeah. no. oh, it's sixty degrees this weekend, Mary. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's common. So we had a whole bunch of snow mid November last year. So we're only about two weeks away from that. Good. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other discussion on the orders? Okay. All in favor of the motion? So, Bill, aye. Mary, aye. Martha, aye. Curtis, aye. Yeah, I'm going All right. Thank you. Okay. Then. Uh, Dave, if if you've got Cheryl right there, we could we could do that next, so she can go home if she wants. Okay, I'm but gonna she's pull her. Right. home. No, Let's she see. Is. I'm gonna pull her in. Give me a moment. I have to put my mask on too. Yeah. Cheryl, why don't you come on in? So before she gets going, I'm just going to say real quick. Um, so this serves two purposes. Uh, the piece of paper that you have in front of me is kind of a yearly um, statutorily thing that the treasurer does. Mm -hmm. uh, it is um, 
I'm not sure if you saw it last year, but uh, it was with you the year before. Uh, we're good. getting ready to submit the bond application, and it needs to be a part of the bond application uh, for the Three Corners Intersection Project. Uh, so you have it for this year, um, and it's essentially, I believe the statutory purpose is that, you know, the select board is held to some degree of accountability on the financial statements. Um, we do bring the auditors, or at least uh, the last three years, we've had the auditors come in and, and do a talk uh, once the audit is produced. So the information has certainly been there and, um, you know, they're available for your question and answer. But a lot of towns don't do that. And this is just kind of a way to keep the select board in tune to the finances in town and to make sure that you're, you know, not completely oblivious to what's going on. So something the treasurer fills out. Uh, Cheryl has done it for you, and um, you, Gordon, you'll need to come in and sign tomorrow um, after you vote, or if you've already voted at some point while you're here doing your duty, um, that would be great. But uh, I'll let Cheryl speak, and if you have any questions, you can fire away. Hi, Cheryl. Um, Hi, Cheryl. I don't have uh, much to add to that. Uh, just answer any questions that you might have. And actually, there was one question. Have select board members attended financial trainings? I didn't know if that was a yes or no, so I left that blank. Yeah, I actually had two questions about um, that. Thanks for helping us with this, Cheryl. Sure. Um, everything seemed above board except the two questions have select board members attended financial trainings and then also does each town official have copies of these policies and procedures and I'm wondering should we attend trainings and have copies of the policies and procedures? Um, I guess I can't uh, perhaps Martin could best address the first question uh, the second question, uh, you could have copies if we had policies, but to my knowledge, we do not have written policies. It's something that uh, I, I talked with Martin last week. The Vermont League of Cities and Towns have model policies that perhaps we can adapt to suit our needs. He was going to take a look at that, and um, we can talk about that more when I see him next week. Um, but that's why we answered that question that way. Okay, thank you. Cheryl, this is Phil. Um, there's a question, do elected town auditors attend financial training? Um, but there's nothing on there about the external auditors, which we have external auditors, not internal, or not staff auditors. Um, should have just been marked no. We don't have elected, we don't have elected auditors, so that could have just been marked no. Oh, okay. So you can just let just confirm with Phil that we don't have elected auditors, so it's not it's not pertinent. Okay. Well, uh, David says we do not have elected auditors. Right. So, yeah. Good. Well, I I would. This is Mary. Um, I would like to have written financial policies. I think that's an oversight that's unfortunate, and I'd like to see that remedied. Um, so, right. um, and I understand you're going to talk to Martin about that some more. Is that is that right, Cheryl? Yes, he is going to uh, take a look at the model policies on okay. the website for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Yeah, yeah. To see great. how they could apply to us. That'd be great. Thank and, you. And Mary, I agree with you and fully support that. Yeah. Cheryl, you're doing a really good job, and I really appreciate that you are there in that position. So well, thank you. Well, you're very welcome. I thank you. I'm enjoying it very much. Oh, good, good. I wonder. I wonder if the League of Cities and Towns or the, or the Extension Service, if they do have financial trainings for select boards or select members. Yeah. Gordon, uh, Martin has been chiming in on the chat and he has 
said, VLCT has classes for budgeting and they also have blueprints for policies and procedures for finances. And uh, they're going to get, get to that and get that to us soon. Oh. Ooh. Okay. I, I would be happy to take, take a class, by the way, if <laughs> the select board wants to send someone to take one. <laughs> I would like to take that class too. Hopefully they'll do a Zoom class, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for Cheryl? Nope. All right. I do I do have one more thing to say to Cheryl on a personal note. We have that other bench. We just yeah. keep getting to give it to you. So I'm sorry. Well, that's but okay. We'll we will drive it down there someday. Okay. <laughs> Take your time. So <laughs> okay. we have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you for coming by. Yeah. Back to business. Thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> All right. Well, we can move on to the Energy Committee. So I'll just give a brief. Um, Kind of a brief introduction here. Um, a couple of weeks, actually, maybe a couple of months ago, Rob came to me and um, kind of expressed an interest to maybe formalize, um, you know, how the energy committee works, um, and you know, formalize a chair and and their timeline and and um, some other aspects of how that committee works. Uh, I thought that was a pretty good idea, and um, the committee has been kind of working on that. And, and I don't know, maybe three weeks ago or so, Rob forwarded uh, what you have in front of you um, for some bylaws for the Energy Committee. Um, I've also given the select board what I had on hand from back in like 2008 and I think Rob you were one of the original members of the energy committee mm -hmm. but uh, there was kind of a you know a, a kind of an informal outline for the energy committee and it was pretty informal it was kind of you know group of volunteers select you know appointed by the select board it was kind of a listing of things for the energy committee to maybe you know focus on going forward and actually maybe two thirds of that list, um, you know, I think that they've maybe have tackled, but obviously I think what you have in front of you, you can see is is a little bit more of a formal outline of, of how the committee conducts, um, you know, kind of a, the, the hierarchy is established in, in some time frames for that. Rob, if you want to pick up from there and. Yeah, so it's, it, uh... I think the the, the, big, the biggest thing that has changed on this from the original uh, forming of this group was really now we have a, a purpose and in that purpose is defined by uh, some of the standards that weren't even, even available uh, 10 years ago. You know, they weren't, you know, weren't even on the horizon. So just kind of puts, puts our purpose and our, you know, our, our mission statement, if you will, forward. Um, and of course, this is all under the expectations of what, what the, what, you know, we, th we think our, we've been tasked by the select board to kind of continue the, the march forward as the energy needs and challenges of our times has changed. So that's, that's really kind of talks to the purpose. Um, one of the things is, you know, we've had a, in the last couple of years, we've had a lot of interest and support with new community members. So uh, wanted to work on kind of formalizing a chair and uh, a secretary. Uh, so that's kind of put in there. And what I did basically is I went to the Conservation Commission and, and pillaged a lot of theirs uh, and, and made it fit with ours, our um, needs requirements here so the, as a group we um we've all sat down and kind of hammered this out and and been approved with the exception of 
the time and place of regular in section four is establishing regular reestablishing on an annual basis our meeting time. Um, so, but the rest of it is the group is approved of it already. So we'd like to submit it to you for your uh, approval or recommendations, refinements, uh, et cetera. Um, and one of the things this, you know, we're going to be looking for is I would hope that the select board would review the membership and make recommendations um, for adding or deleting people as we go um, as they see fit. I know a couple of you guys, uh, a couple of the gentlemen on this do attend our meetings regularly. Um, we set them up a couple years, maybe a year and a half ago to make sure they didn't conflict with the, with your uh, meetings. And um, that was so people that are part of the energy committee could join uh, your meetings and vice versa. So I would encourage um, not just <laughs> Phil and Curtis, but anybody that's got um, some interest in what we're doing and what we're working on for the town to please join us. Well, Rob, so. I just want to interject here. If if any more of us were to come, then we'd have to warn the meetings, like warn that we were going to be there because three or more select board members causes all kinds of legalese, legal stuff. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That's well, why only two people so go. There was that, so, Mary, there was that. At, remember at the... Uh, um, at the hazard mitigation planning meeting, Dave basically told me I was not allowed to talk because <laughs> Phil got there before me and you were part of the <laughs> leading the charge. Yeah, that's not an ideal accommodation. So I would anyway, we could take turns just as long as there were just two of us there. I'd be very happy to take turns. OK, uh, Rob, this is a Mary's question is a good lead into my question. Uh, you don't mention the size of the group, and then under the meetings, you talk about a quorum. And how do you know what the quorum is if you don't know what the size of the group is? So, it, and that's, I think I put in there currently what the quorum is. Yeah, I think you have four. Right, four. because I think we have eight members. And quite honestly, Phil, this group has gone from Oh, probably 10 people initially down to two, down to actually one working member with Carl Kemnitzer for years. And then in the last couple of years, it's it's grown. Um, I suspect if history repeats itself, we'll start to see some people um, kind of disappear, uh, and, you know, drop out. And we'll have to revisit the, you know, the, the quorum to make sure that it's a majority. So good question. Uh, I, I don't put in that we need X amount of people. I'm always looking for more input. I think we're a very diverse group and I think everybody brings something different to the table. Um, so and some of the projects that we work on uh, can be kind of labor intensive. Uh, and, we're, you know, we'll be looking for volunteers for one of them later on when it gets off the ground, probably in a year. So uh, I, I've kept it kind of vague for that reason, because our our membership has varied over the years dramatically. Rob, uh, that's a good point for me to bring up a suggestion that I have. Um, I think that it get, it's getting too formal to call these bylaws. I don't think you need bylaws. You need guidelines. And if you had guidelines and they weren't as firm as maybe bylaws imply they should be, then you wouldn't have so much trouble meeting a quorum. You follow my saying? Um, I, I do. We, you know, to be honest with you, Gordon, and, and I, I, I'm writing a, a point down, you know, to take back to the group. Um, we, for the last year and a half, we, we really haven't had a problem with meeting a quorum at our meetings um, so that we can go ahead and have them. There is a lot of really strong interest and um, people on the on committed people to it. So uh, and, and let me back up a second because um, we had a change in the chair this year and this was the the request was to kind of formalize 
how we how often and when we choose a chair and that's what drove this to, to put it into a bylaws um i i don't disagree with you I, I i thought it was a little bit much because we're such you know we're appointed by you but in a lot of ways we're kind of an ad hoc group in, here in town but there were some people in the committee that really felt that they wanted to kind of formalize uh who's in it and uh, the leadership on this and kind of make sure that it gets revisited on a regular basis. So, Rob, um, I was there at the meeting where it became sort of painfully obvious that it would be nice to have a set of guidelines that formalize this process a little more. So I'm glad to see that you have the yearly uh, revisiting of the chair and the clerk. Um, but the concern that I would have is that in here you haven't actually detailed how you would prevent such a painful occurrence in the future if, for instance, there was a need or a desire to change in the middle of the year or, or something like that. There's no stipulations or anything for that process. So are you thinking that it would just if the chair, for instance, um, becomes not a working member anymore, that the duties of the chair would fall to the clerk for the remainder of the appointment, or how would that work? So I think if you look at these these guidelines, it would fall. I'm sorry, are you still talking? He's muted. Curtis, you muted. Yeah, I muted myself so I could listen. Oh, OK, it looked like you're still talking. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, to be honest with you, Curtis, I didn't give that a whole lot of thought. I and mean, I don't think anybody in the group really gave it a whole lot of thought that. Um, <laughs> and it, it would kind of fall to the clerk to lead the group for the rest of the, the duration until the next turnover. Um, Rob, Rob, you've got you've got your last number six says these bylaws may be amended at any regular meeting. Seems like that covers everything. Get you off the hook. You can do what you want to do. Okay. But so to I, answer Curtis's question, I hadn't really, I, we hadn't given that a whole lot of thought, but it's a good point to kind of chew on. So, Dave, what's the difference between a commission and a committee? Uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure, but off the cuff, I know that the Planning Commission and the Conservation Commission are essentially outlined by statute. So I'm going to guess that it probably starts there. Okay. Um, even though the conservation, even though Rob lifted most of this off of the Conservation Commission, um, if you were to go into statute, almost everything the Conservation Commission has written down for their bylaws, if you want to call it a bylaw, is actually set in statute, uh, as is the Planning Commission is also set in statute, except for with the Planning Commission, I think you can, with a vote of the select board, you can deviate, you know, between seven and nine members or something like that. The, the number can change, but the functionality of it is kind of set. So I'm going to guess that's where it starts. Um, whereas the committee is kind of a committee of the select board. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I would say that's probably the biggest difference if there is, if there is one. Okay. So, Thank so you. So Mary, Mary, I think that brings up the point of who's in control. And if you, if everything is done by statute, it's obviously the state. And if it's done by committee, under the select board that leaves us in control. So I would think we would we would choose the latter. Um, Rob, I have some other like uh, editing things, so maybe I could just send them to you separately. Um, there's there, you know, t typos or things left out or just consistency things. Um, I do have one thing, Dave, isn't the town report supposed to be about the previous fiscal year, not the previous calendar year? So 
My understanding, so the, the financial reports are from the fiscal year. So this spring's town report will have the, the, the fiscal year 20 financial yeah. data that we just finished June 30th. Yeah. But it's been my understanding that primarily the, the reports, like the town manager report that I put in, will be essentially January 2020 to December 31st, 2020. So, so my report, my okay. report tends to go on the calendar year. Okay. And the financial reports tend to go on the fiscal year. Okay. That that was one question. All right. Uh, oh, it's, and it's, it's not always, you know, I think that's kind of the way the myself, the select board, and even the commissions and committees. The the Vermont State Police data, for instance, is going to be on the fiscal is basically on the contract year, which is our fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, and there may be one or two other reports that are on the the, the contract year, but um, that's just know that there's a little bit of a difference out there. Okay, thanks. Oh, I do have one another question, <laughs> Rob. Um, I don't think you defined clean energy and. Um, I think that would be a good uh, addition because you talk about clean energy, but you don't define it. I think every and I think everybody knows what sustainable energy is. Maybe that needs to be defined too, but um, I wonder if people have a different idea of what clean energy is, you know so. Okay, um, I, I can see where that opens up a can of worms <laughs> because <laughs> depending on what who you're listening to, they're, they're going to define uh, clean energy uh, differently. Well, that's uh, what I was thinking. And so yeah, and, and how does the committee define it? Well, I, I think. There, there may have been some verbiage, and I, I, I may have it wrong. So this year we worked on a, on the town plan in the energy section with um, Two Rivers mm -hmm. on uh, redoing that. And I'm not, I, I don't remember off the top of my head whether that was defined in there. Okay. Um, but you know, you for do the refer to that. Uh, so, but for the purposes of this group, mm -hmm. uh, what's the benefit in in defining those? Um, I, I guess I would ask, you know, wh why would we want to need to define this for the for this group in the bylaws here? Well, because it's just it's a it's a document that, uh, like all documents, meant to be read by uh, more than just a, a select group of people. It's it's better to err on the side of clarity than not. So you may understand what that is, but somebody who's looking to join the group might have a question about it. I, I mean, I'm not wedded to this this uh, thought, but um, it did bring up a question in my mind. Sure, I, and I'm happy to bring that back to the group, uh, you know, and and mm -hmm. see what whether there's a consensus on that and. Okay how we might define that and uh, then resubmit it if, if the select board would like us to. Mary, yeah, I'm Mary, only one voice. Mary, I think you might have to write a book to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. we could just do we could just do one of those. Uh, here's a link. To, here's three links to reference at, you know, on, yeah. the, on the web. There you go. Uh, take care of it. Thank you. Muted, so. Yeah, so, I, I was saying, where is the Nello Meadows now that we really need her? So, <laughs> so and I would also uh, say, I believe Sarah Bruce, who's another very active member on the Energy Committee, is on. I'm not sure if she'd like to add anything um, to what we've talked about. Can you repeat um, that? Um, Rob, I would, I would like to hear from Sarah. Um, I do have a couple thoughts about the purpose. Uh, and then a couple things throughout the document that might be nice to add. Um, my my first thought when I was reading this 
Um, and this might seem really minor, and it is really minor, but also it might be major, I don't know, is that I thought it was very interesting that the first sentence says we're understanding and implementing economically and environmentally sound energy. And energy committee, it seems kind of backwards that the economically comes first, um, where the environmentally is the, the remit of the committee. Um, so that was my first thought as I was reading it. And then I wondered if this was, um, if inside this purpose might be a good opportunity to say something like the Energy Committee offers guidance to the select board to achieve the goals um, in the climate change article that passed by unanimous consent at town meeting in 2019 or something like that. Um, that might be an opportunity to do that as well. Uh, and then within the document itself, you refer multiple times to the open meeting laws. And and th those are a good guideline for us right now because that's the strongest sort of thing that we have. Um, but it's possible that Heartland could implement policies that are above and beyond the state statute requirements. Um, so within this document, you might want to leave that open as a possibility as well. Yeah. So those are my thoughts. I'm just making a note here, you know, to add uh, add verbiage. Um, uh, to the town adopted resolution uh, on energy. Um, how does the rest of the group so feel I, about that? I want to rob, did you have a specific, did you have I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Specific off. goal when you put. Did you have a specific goal when you put economically and environmentally sound, or would you be fine with those? The wording of that switching. Well, I don't think there. You know, I don't think it, one or the other weighs more than the other because one were economically or environmentally weighs more or less because of the order of it. I mean, they're both important. Um, so I think that's just, you know, it's, Curtis, it's a logical operand and it puts both at equal importance. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Yeah, I understand logics, but there's also just a pragmatics of where you encounter things that gives pride of place to one thing versus another. You know, maybe maybe Rob's trying to keep the politics out of it. I mean. I think pretty clearly that's not possible. <laughs> Gordon, you you have the benefit of not being on the list, sir. So <laughs> it seems nothing can be said anymore that's not political. <laughs> so I mean, if it's not political and if it's the same, then why not flip them? <clears throat> Sarah, do you have any comments to add? What's that asking me? That's uh, asking you, yes. Yes, okay. Um, I didn't quite understand whether Rob was talking to me a while, two minutes ago or not. Um, I think, and I may be wrong, Rob, you can correct me. I believe that phrasing that you guys have been discussing about economically and environmentally sound, that was a, a point of discussion, shall we say, and the order. Am I right, Rob? And um, it, it really goes back to something, and I didn't, I'm afraid, I'm surprised I don't hear things as clearly. But, um, Phil earlier asked something about the issue about a quorum relative to the size of the committee. I do believe the committee is currently seven because Zach Ralph was the eighth member and he, of course, had to step down when he moved from Heartland. So, um, but, 
I think the quorum actually does. It certainly when we were doing the heap, the quorum was rather important, knowing exactly what it was, because then we, if there was any disagreement and let's say hearty discussion on the energy plan, uh, we knew exactly we had to have a quorum so that we could get a majority of the quorum. So I, I do think the quorum has to be pretty well defined. Um, Although I didn't understand Phil's entire um, comment. Um, whether or not, in, in answer to Mary, whether or not clean energy, quote unquote, clean energy is defined in the energy plan. Um, if you wanted me to, I could do a search for the word right now. I have the thing on the computer, not up right now, but um, I really cannot tell you. It's a very long document and I don't trust my memory as to whether or not it's there. Um, Thank you. I think I was glad to see Rob produce these bylaws um, because I think I think the group, I mean, w there are disagreements and whether they're the political aspect of it or not, I, I, we have to deal with it, political or not. We have to deal with energy. So um, I think it's good to have this information laid out. Um, and I I think, I believe it was a unanimous approval by the committee before this was passed on to you. Um, and whether everybody was in attendance of the meeting with unanimous approval, I cannot remember. I'd have to look that up. But I think it's actually for this group, at least currently, very good to have this in writing. We may need to tweak it, um, and improve it, but um, I think it's important. I don't so know. So I answering anybody's I question. Brought up, I brought up the issue of economically and environmentally sound, and I feel like the response from both Rob and Phil was the order of those doesn't actually matter at all. It's not a real thing, and Sarah's now saying actually. The order of those was a very real thing, and we discuss it, and there was debate about it. Could it you expand on that, Sarah? Discussion. It was a point of discussion. Am I wrong, Rob? Do you remember? Uh, I, I don't remember what the outcome of the discussion was, so I'm, I'm a little flat-footed here. Um, Sarah, I, I think I would just interject in that you said that this came out of the committee basically unanimous. Yeah. So there, there may have been discussion on it, but at the end of the day, it's a it's a it's a document that the energy committee put forth unanimously for you know whatever reasons you know the select board can take it from there. But um, you know Rob, I think is looking for feedback from the board at this point. Um, you know I I would just you know I, getting into whether the energy committee did or didn't mean this or that. I think there's for this discussion is a little, um, you know, I, I, it's something for the energy committee maybe. And if, if you propose this and Curtis wants to take it up this like board level, that's fine. But, um, you know, for the sake of keeping this moving, I would say that, you know, the document came out unanimously and this is the document and, you know, kind of go from there. Um, Curtis, uh, Phil, um, you, brought up the Article 12 and um, the idea that the uh, Energy Committee would would help to advise the select board on on, on, on how to meet the, the spirit of Article 12. Do you think that we could dovetail that point into the opening sentence? Um, because it really is about Helping the select board and understanding and engineering the, the two re words, sound energy decisions, maybe uh, based on the spirit of Article 12 in uh, 2020. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if we're. Yeah, I mean, no, that, that sounds like a great solution. I, I have no solution in mind. I was just thinking that would be a nice place to uh, put in that the town may their will express in this. 
So that wording sounds good to me, Phil. So rather than go down down a, you know, a long debate on this, I will say that that Article 12 was not a part of the Energy Committee. Um, that was an ad hoc group here in town. So, you know, if the select board wants to give us direction to add that um, as part of our purpose, that's fine. But, you know, the, the select board didn't instruct us to put together Article 12. There may have been members that are part of the Energy Committee that worked on Article 12, but as a group, Article 12 was an ad hoc group separate completely from the Heartland Energy Committee. Right, and the select board changed the wording of Article 12, so we could be getting into a quagmire. Yeah. Phil, if my memory serves me, that Article 12 became rather um, a general, very general guideline, if I, if I remember right. It didn't have much of anything left specific to it, but I guess when we got done with it, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. Yes, correct. Isn't that right? I would agree. Yeah. yeah, well, we do have specific goals based off of Vermont's comprehensive energy plan as, as part of our purpose. So I actually do feel like we've got a little bit more guidance than Article 12 already built in, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I think I think there definitely is more complete guidance in other places, but one of the reasons I think it might be really nice to include Article 12 is that it was it was something that originated in town amongst a group of people passed unanimously at town meeting day and it specifically instructed the uh, in a non-binding way the select board to by acknowledging incorporate acknowledgement of the changing of climate into decisions that the town makes and i think that one really clear space where that can happen is in the energy committee. And by incorporating this unanimously consented article by the town into the guiding principles of the energy committee, I, I think that really helps fulfill the spirit of the article that originated in Heartland and was passed in Heartland. Okay, I, I think it's time to uh stop discussing this and decide if we do want to have some action on this or do we want to let the energy committee uh, mull it over some more and come back another time. I'm not sure where we're at here. Um, anybody want to make a, a motion of any kind? What do you think, Phil? <laughs> Well, I, I, I like I like the overall plan. We, we certainly uh, battered around a number of small changes and Mary has a few that she wants to send along. Um, you know, I hate to just postpone it and, and have folks come back. Um, I, I certainly I would approve the spirit of what's here. Yeah. It, it does call for us to take action on the agenda. Well, I don't know. Does that mean, Gordon, that we have to take I don't action? Think, I don't think so. But but I think that I think we could in in approve it um, in a general sense because I like I like I pointed out before, Article Six amendments are uh, on the floor all the time. There's no problem changing things. So. I don't know why we couldn't approve this. Uh, well, I mean, institutional inertia is a real thing. And once a document gets established, even if it's possible to change it in a way that seems really easy, that institutional inertia makes it difficult for that to actually have oftentimes. Well, maybe, but I'll fall back to my first comment. I would like to see it again. I mean, I, I, I fully I fully support the the consideration of membership and, and and when to think about officers and all of that. And I understand the history of what caused the production of this document. 
And I think in, in large part, this document does a lot to help solve that. But there are changes that I would like to see in it. So you're suggesting we wait and have them come back another time? Yeah. Arthur, do you have a thought? Um, so, I'm sorry, who? I want to hear from Martha. I'm sorry. Um, I think this discussion has brought up some good uh, suggestions and along with Mary's comments, maybe it would be good for the, for Rob and the committee to take a look at this and bring it back and I, maybe it would be quick to the second time you come to the meeting. It wouldn't have to be another long discussion. I'll shake my head yes to. Is, is that okay with you, Rob? Is that inconvenience you at all or what? No, I, I you know, I, quite honestly, I, it's going to be a short discussion because, you know, as a group, there are many of our group that feel that the Article 12 was a worthwhile cause and put energy into it certainly could word some, smith something in this um, and there there was an extra line that was added to this subsequent to our last meeting that we're going to discuss so i think we can do that and and have it back to you uh at uh, the first weekend the first week in december and close the books on this i don't think it needs to be a long drawn out thing you know the the intent was just to get an alignment with uh, the officers um, and state our our purpose and make sure that we're on the same page as the select board who appointed us. So short work of it. And how many members do you have right now, Rob? I believe we have seven. So the quorum right now would be a majority, which needs to be four people. So in the town report, that's an up to date list of the seven members. Uh, I don't have the town report in front of me, but no, it's it's changed since the town report. I submitted a, a membership list to you guys earlier this year, and I that has changed by one um, because of Zach mm -hmm. okay. leaving. You know, don't forget that the, the town report that I've got in front of me right now is put together essentially in, you know, that page is put together in January prior to March. So that list would be 11 months, 10 months old at this point. I know Zach leaving is and at I least one, if not, even maybe. Bob, even have I do want to say, I, 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 it's been, it's been really nice to see you chair the energy committee. I, it is, I've, I've been watching it and it's been a pleasure. So none of this is anything about, about you or about the committee. I think they're both wonderful. Um, I just think they're maybe by revisiting a little bit might be able to have some more thoughts about it. Okay. No, I guess, so. You're muted, so we can't hear you. That's okay. I think we need to move along. I think we've, we've, we've I think we've come to a consensus here. Okay. All right. So I will come back in December after revisiting this with the with the group. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for Thanks your time. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Sarah. All right. So I don't. I have a. a a curveball off of the agenda. Oh, okay, go ahead. So when we're doing the Energy Committee um, audit, so, so this year we worked on getting audits of Damon Hall and uh, the rec center put together to help Dave with his long range plans on these and you know see what we can do to improve the efficiency of those buildings. Which, by the way, Dave, I did hear back from the guy. We should be getting that. Um, but while we were doing that, we were upstairs in the top of Damon Hall, and there is a plethora of books up there 
of and magazines and some of them going back to the turn of the 20th century so <laughs> there was four of them that caught my eyes and i said oh i wonder if anybody wants these i wonder if they would miss them i wonder if i could take them home <laughs> so i'd like to like to see uh, what is the plan for those books and um, would they be willing to be would you guys and I've been told that you guys are are in charge of that uh, uh, what's up there uh, and I'm Rob, wondering what, is this in the back room upstairs in the back room yeah so that was uh, historic society stuff uh, no this is Actually, I don't know. It's all the way. It's not in the back room. It's it's, it's in the attic. In the attic. Yeah. Up the ladder and into the attic. Yeah. All right. Somebody had a lot of energy. Uh, I don't know. Why so there's stuff up there. There was there was one on American history, and then there was one. There was a three set volume on on uh, world history, um, and it's really just a giggle because. <laughs> What was written a hundred years ago, a lot of times tends to be revisionist history, where it's a little bit more black and white when people write about it now. So I just wanted to do it, be able to have those and look at them and, and see the difference of how it would be written a hundred years ago or so. So, well, how about if you donate them to the historical society after you're done with them? You know, like leave them to the historical society in your will. How about that, Rob? <laughs> that could be a little. I hope that's a little while off, but sure. It could be, but you need to make plans now. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I, I mean, I was about to say I think maybe first crack should go to the library or historical society, but I'm not sure where these came from. But I was I was told unofficially that they may have come from our our library years ago. The town library, mm -hmm. or been donated to the library at one point in time, and I don't have an answer. <laughs> uh, I don't think I, a book a book sitting sitting unread isn't worth anything. <laughs> Well, as long as I don't have to come back and give you a book report on it. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> don't worry, we'll revise the report if you do. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd ask. I don't need an answer tonight. I don't think they're going to go anywhere. They've probably been sitting up there for 50 years. Um, but I'd like to have considerations uh, for four of the books that I found. Okay. All right. Let's Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, thank Rob. Thanks, Rob. Um, Dave, you want to make that your um, report on the, the virus at this point? Uh, yeah, and uh, my report is not going to differ too much from the national report, um, other than uh, I'll give a quick update on Halloween from a, a trick or treater perspective. It was pretty quiet. Uh, there may have been some, you know, some some neighborly trick or treating, but uh, overall, uh, there was um, people stayed home uh, or stayed stuck real close to their own neighborhood, um, which perhaps isn't a bad thing. Uh, I just, again, this is being echoed by almost anybody involved in uh, the virus and in kind of keeping track of trying to keep staff. Um, coming to work is that is and this goes for the select board it goes for the energy committee it goes for the conservation and planning commission i can't say enough that you know people have just fallen into kind of a relaxed state um summer was good uh, we got kind of comfortable we're kind of in a routine things are definitely picking up um and uh you know i think it's we need to kind of get back that awareness. Um, certainly don't know if we need the fear that we had in the springtime, but certainly we need to have the awareness that we had in the springtime. Uh, it did go on the list, sir, but I'll just throw out the stats for Windsor County. Um, nine people uh, are on record for having the, the virus in Heartland. Um, just in the last 14 days, uh, there's been 20 in Windsor County. 
uh, and 128 overall for Windsor County. Uh, Vermont has seen um, a pretty good increase. We don't have the hundreds that um, you know some of the other states have, but uh, when you see numbers up to 25 a, a day after you've had two to three a day, um, it's noticeable. Uh, so um, I just think it's important that people stay aware. I'm also just going to put it out there. Um, you know, if after Thanksgiving, um, we may be looking at entertaining the thought of, of you know, keeping part of the staff home like we did before in the springtime. Um, I think it uh, uh, we'll have to see how this continues to go, but to have the full staff here, um, you know, again, um, you know, there's a certain danger in, you know, if one person gets it, um, we need to quarantine. So um, I think that there's going to need to be, if we continue on this track and, and what I'm hearing is, is that we will, I think we just need to keep our minds open that we may need to slowly, um, you know, rotate or keep people home or, or something to that idea. Um, and quarantine is, uh, is not fun, um, nor is the fact that we can't operate um, at least at the most basic level. So just keep that in mind. I put that as a reminder um, and that things are going um, kind of back towards springtime. Uh, Vermont hasn't seen that numbers, but certainly nationally they are. So just um, let's okay. so have a quick question. Keep the, the nine in Heartland, is that the total for the disease? It is, yes. Okay. Uh, but the 20 in Windsor County is in the past 14 days. Yeah. So but, took but, us but, took us a long time to get to 25 for a number back in the spring. Um, and that was just in a 14 day period. So and I do just want to say the research from Canadian Thanksgiving has come back. And as expected, there was a very significant boost around two and a half to three weeks in their infection rate and positivity rates after Canadian Thanksgiving. So, caution. Then we have Christmas and Hanukkah. So, uh, and cold weather. So, we'll have to keep an eye on things. That's all. It's all. Don't want to be too much of a downer, but um, just trying to keep people grounded. All right. Um, well, let's move on to the Merrick Campbell Fund discussion then. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, Mary Campbell Fund is back on the agenda. Last time we spoke about it, um, you know, we kind of talked about it coming back to the agenda. Um, I, I think that um, there was some, um, I, I think that after the last discussion, it was a decent discussion, but I think some things need to be clarified. There was kind of a motion out there that didn't get seconded, but there was kind of a lengthy discussion after that. Um, uh, that that just seemed to wind its way down with not a whole lot of a you know resolution to it. Uh, so the mere fact that we wanted to bring it back at some point and you know it never really had a resolution. I think it's uh, is the main purpose for it being back on the agenda tonight. Uh, however, and I've got some to go over. Uh, I am going to spend some time on this because I'm not sure. Um, in speaking with um, some of you individually, how clear the thought process was or, or, you know, how clear the concept was from the last discussion. So I am going to go over some of this. Uh, but before I get too far into it, I just want to, you know, keep the, spend a little bit of time and just remind the board that, you know, we do have kind of an important couple of months coming up here. Uh, we have the budget season coming up. Uh, part of that will be uh, the building ordinance discussion um, and maybe some discussion on the roads. Um, I certainly think that that is probably our highest priority um, and to get that wrapped up and, you know, approved going into January and then, you know, putting, you know, the 
the the articles for town meeting together and as such, I think is is um, most important. Uh, however, um, this idea of the Mary Campbell Fund and um, you know some case management, I think that there's some room here. I don't think it's a huge change. I think it's kind of a tweak. Uh, I think that the process is in place um, as it is. Uh, so I think that this is something that um, we can talk about. I don't think it's going to throw us two off the rails. I also think that, you know, and I gave you some paperwork in your packets. You know, I think we've had eight at least serious, um, you know, discussions or cases uh, for Merrick Campbell Fund in the last two years. So it's not something that we need to, you know, we don't need to have any answer for it, you know, in the next 10 minutes. You know, obviously, you know, this has stood for 100 years. Um, it continues to stand. It, it is um, a good fund. The town is lucky to have it. But um, I don't think it's something that, you know, has to be solved in, in a 10 minute span. Uh, I will get into, and this is where I'm just going to kind of backtrack for a moment here um, and kind of bring us back in the discussion and uh, take a few minutes. Um, ironically, where this whole idea of, you know, looking at the Merrick Campbell Fund um, and looking for maybe some support actually originates from the select board. Um, in several of the past cases that we've had, uh, I have sat there and watched the select board kind of struggle with some decision making for for um, requests. You know, some of what I've heard is, you know, OK, we give them four hundred and fifty dollars. You know, the request is X amount. Yeah, OK, it's great. We give them the money. But is that going to really solve the problem? Are they going to be back four months from now? You know, are they going to be a repeat customer? Um, that creeps into our discussion a lot, um, particularly the last few discussions that we've had. Um, so I think that, you know, the discussion on the case management um, is kind of stemmed by that. Also, during these same meetings, uh, select board members have expressed um, the need for assistance um, in determining needs and amounts of money. Uh, that should be granted a lot of times um, or at least a few times in these meetings. I've heard, boy, it would be nice to have, um, you know, a resource to kind of bounce this off of. Um, I, that's been a part of the discussion. And I'll also add that um, there were two members of the select board that actively participated in um, kind of the subcommittees or committees on wellness. And um, out of those meetings, uh, both select board members um, did express uh, their concerns uh, about making determinations for Mary Campbell requests. So there's kind of this underlying, you know, glad to have it, but certainly, you know, okay, you know, some are very clear cut and the decision is very easy. And then there's other ones that there's there's some complexity to it and kind of OK, you know, but is this really going to help giving them money? Is that helpful or is there a longer term solution? And I think that we've had that discussion a couple of times. Uh, as I said, we're kind of lucky to have this fund. Um, but what I will add here, and it's interesting that, um, you know, not certainly I've been with a couple of municipalities now. I haven't come across anybody that has a fund such as this, or at least one that is as deep as this. Uh, this is a pretty endowed fund. Uh, towns used to be essentially solely responsible for the poor or those that um, were uh, had economic uh, issues or had socioeconomic situations that um, they they needed help. Uh, it used to fall completely on the towns. Uh, coming out of the 60s and into the 70s, that slowly transferred to the state. The state has now essentially taken almost all responsibility for um, those in need. Um, and at this point, uh, it's not only uh, actually kind of through the state, uh, a lot of times the, the state kind of disperses 
um, money or programs through individual nonprofits or other social agencies. So I'd say like since the 70s, essentially a kind of bureaucracy has formed uh, and it's actually a pretty in-depth bureaucracy if I could call it that. Uh, in your packets, I did give you a booklet about 60 pages um, for various um, situations, uh, various entities that could be called or, or may provide resources. Uh, I also gave you an appropriation sheet. Um, I can't remember how many I highlighted, but there's at least 10 um, that we fund directly. Um, you know, some of these are, are kind of go-to agencies for uh, socioeconomic uh, assistance. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, in today's day and age, um, somebody should be able to, instead of calling us, should be able to call the state's 211 system, um, get a person 24 hours, and um, get assistance or direction on where they can go to get assistance. Um, so there's, there is a system outside of the Mary Campbell Fund that is very much in place and um, covers almost anything that you can think of if um, you can connect the correct dots. The only drawback is kind of like any bureaucracy, the 211 system isn't perfect. Um, you can call them and you, know, you may get an operator that's not as experienced as the other one, um, or you know they can't explain something well enough, or they put it in your lap and the, the person calling needs to follow through and that falls through for whatever reason. Also, I will say, and you, if you look through that booklet that I gave you, to a point, there's almost like too many resources. Uh, you know, so you've got, you know, I can, you know, I've heard someone say there's upwards to 200 different resources between Claremont and Lebanon and, and including Heartland um, that, you can find the only problem is is that they are they fit certain niches okay if you've got you know um a, a, a certain you know if you're over 65 and and you know you need assistance for something you know you fit this box if you are um you know looking for something else you know strictly heating assistance there may be five boxes that you can go to um however it's somewhat you know individual they each have you know resources and their limited resources whether it be grant funds or something from the state of vermont for a particular purpose and you got to fit that box um and on top of that those resources don't always talk to one another um so one resource may not know that another one can provide something that they can't um, or they may know that they're out there, but, you know, they may be, you know, I know that there was someone that was a new, you know, had been an executive director at one of these agencies for about a year and, um, you know, was like, yeah, you know, it's, it's a learning process and it's somewhat difficult to navigate. Um, and, you know, unless you have some assistance. Um, that's kind of why having our own fund is also a benefit, you know, so that if it doesn't fit one of those boxes, we've got our fund that we can draw from, you know, okay, you've got, you need snow tires and, and, you know, there's nobody out there that provides snow tires and you have a certain situation and the select board agrees then we can, we can provide for that. Uh, however, I think what is being proposed here is kind of a hybrid, kind of a, you know, taking the Merrick Camel Fund without a whole lot of work, um, utilizing practically the same process that's in place today, and simply saying, basically realizing that, okay, this $500 is not going to solve the problem. Okay, they've come to us for 500 bucks, we've got the 500 bucks, but we all know giving them the 500 bucks isn't the solution to this problem. That's when having a per diem type person that can provide 
resource or provide the knowledge, being able to extract the needed in information from that individual because you do need to extract information. You kind of need to extract budgetary information. You kind of need to know what's going on in their life. And then you need to know these silos or all these individual agencies that are out there, how they may fit into that. I don't think that's for, actually, I know, I shouldn't say I don't think, I know that's not for everybody. I don't think it's for the select board. I don't think it's for me. Um, however, I think that we can probably find somebody, again, on a per diem basis that can perhaps fill that niche or fill that void. Um, it's not someone full-time, it's not somebody part-time. Again, I think that uh, we don't have huge demand. You know, again, eight over two years, you know, we could uncover a rock and, you know, presto, we've got more than we imagined. Um, but I think that if it becomes more than <clears throat> what we imagined, then there's, you know, you can look at other funding sources. You're not stuck to utilizing the Merrick Campbell Fund. But I think it's a good place to start because we don't know really other than what we've had historically what's out there if you were to start to um, you know offer just a little bit extra and something that's going to put somebody um, in a better place uh, and I'll also add that it's only the need only exists if that box out there and again remember there's like 200 of them doesn't have somebody that can offer that for you. So already we know that, you know, if somebody utilizes Mount Escutney Hospital, well, we know somebody that can provide case management for them. We don't need our own person. We call that person. <clears throat> if someone has uh, a disability, you know, you can call ACRS. They have case management services. If someone is having homeless or having housing shortage or a problem, you call the Haven. They have case management services. However, in talking with these various individual agencies and people that do this, there are those times where it doesn't fit the box, okay? They don't get medical service in Mount Escutney. They live in North Heartland. They go to White River family practice, or they go to Alice Peck Day, or they go to Dartmouth Hitchcock that doesn't have that. They don't have a disability. They're not homeless. You know, for whatever reason, economic services out of White River Junction can't help them. There's just rare instances where the bureaucracy doesn't work. Um, however, a high 90% of the time or more, the bureaucracy is there. Economic services can help. SEFCA can help, HCRGS can help, Senior Solutions can help, and go on and on and on. Those are out there. It does exist when it doesn't, it's not out there. And I think that all that's being proposed is that we look to perhaps have someone that we know would be available again on an on-call per diem basis when it doesn't fit the box that you can go to um, and utilize and provide for something above and beyond just, you know, paying for, you know, the muffler repair this month. Um, <clears throat> I will just kind of wrap it up and then you can have some discussion. There, if you, and I won't get into too much detail here because, you know, this, you know, does encroach upon, um, you know, things that shouldn't be in, in a public discussion, but I think I can go enough. Uh, our last three cases provide um, a real good clue as to how the procedure would work. And it's exactly the way and what we've been doing for the past, since I've been here. So a couple of cases ago, uh, and I mentioned it already, there was a request um, and the need was for um, snow tires. And um, the request came in to me, I fielded it. I asked questions, I checked around. Um, I got some additional input. 
I was able to turn around. I took that to the select board. There was agreement that uh, there was a particular was certainly a need by this particular family. Um, certainly was a need being winter time. Certainly was something that the Mary Campbell Fund could do. There was no other boxes out there to check. And the winter snow tires was something that the Mary Campbell Fund could do. It was fielded by me. It came through to the select board. Decision was made. Finance office took it from there. The case after that, uh, I was contacted by uh, the Congregational Church and the Christmas Fund um, and was alerted to a situation that exceeded their capacity to act. Um, it was a situation that we don't normally fund, but um, through discussion, it certainly became apparent that this was going to be a one-time need. Uh, we were also able to incorporate the UU Church. Uh, it was certainly a joint effort. Uh, there was very little, um, you know, we, we had somebody that had was already familiar with the situation, was familiar with the family, um, you know, could uh, explain it. We knew that the money was going to a good place. Um, it came in through um, another door in town, but like other Merrick Campbell Fund requests that come from churches or the food bank or something to that effect. Um, you know, it may start there. They may not be the best fit. Again, these little individual boxes. Um, and it's determined that Merrick Campbell Fund is a good fit. The last case that we had was certainly, I think, that not our last, which was a whole lot more complex. Um, it came through me. Um, there was several discussions with this individual and others. Um, it wasn't clear cut. Um, after having these discussions, it certainly appeared that there was um, some real issues here, you know, some 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 things that, um, you know, money was not going to solve at least one check. Um, was not going to solve this problem. It was going to be four months later. This person was going to be back. Um, it just so happened that uh, it was uh, a Mount of Scutney um, patient. Uh, we were in, and it came in through me. I came to the select board and said, look, here's the situation. This is what's going on. Um, it is unique. It is um, here's my thoughts. I think we should give this person a call and um, have this person follow up and essentially do some real case management. Uh, this person did do that. And I think that um, at the end of the day, this person is a whole lot better off. We did end up using some Mary Campbell fund uh, for this person, but um, it was kind of to bridge the gap before the long-term um, solutions kicked in. So there's three different scenarios. Basically, our last three cases, um, one of which involves case management that utilizes the same procedure we've got today. Um, the only difference I'm talking about here is if our box, being Mount of Scutney, isn't available and there's really no other box there, but we know a check isn't going to cut it. And I think that this is in the language that I sent to you of, of the Merit Campbell funds. It basically says for, you know, to assist, doesn't say give them 400 bucks. It says assist to the best that you can. Then, you know, I think that this is a step that is, again, is a kind of bridges the gap between town responsibility and state responsibility is just an extra step to get this person or family to a better long term situation rather than trying to heem and haw as to whether, you know, the 400 bucks is going to work or not. So I just wanted to kind of clarify the thoughts on that. That's kind of what we're talking about. Um, again, uh, I don't see this as being a real drastic change. I think the only thing as far as what's being talked about here is identifying the per diem person. 
um, and you know what the cost would be. And I think that I, uh, without getting too much into it in, in public discussion, um, because nobody has been you know contacted, um, I'm going to say that there is an existing framework um, that you might. I think the town would start with encroaching that. Uh, idea. Uh, there is a community nurse, um, limited hours with aging and heartland. Um, you know, um, she does do other things on her own, um, and that might be an option. Otherwise, I know that there is a good four to six individuals in town that do this type of work. You know, putting a letter out to them as to whether there would be some interest there. Um, you know, I think that that's the starting place. But you know, I'm just going to you know, I'm just going to, again, hammer it into you. This is not, I don't think, complicated. You know, again, I'm real close to this. You know, I kind of deal with this. For me, it's kind of clear cut, but I don't think it's something to overthink. And I think it's pretty, um, can be done with, with little change. And if it does, if we are, I'll frame it this way, if we're too successful, then I think that there's other options. But what we ran into with the subcommittee was, you know, what do we have out there and, you know, what kind of structure can work? And, um, you know, I think that this is a good starting place. And if it's too successful, then you go with a plan B, which is, you know, budget the money. You can put it in an appropriation. There's no reason why these funds can't take donations. Um, or you maybe work with another town or two and, um, you know, expand on what you got. Question, Dave. Dave, I have a question. Where did the guidelines come from? You have printed below the deeds here. Uh, with the, the Barrett Campbell guidelines? Yes. Uh, that is uh, was in the, the deep, dark records of um, the town manager's office. And to my understanding, um, the one through five is what you've essentially been practicing um, while yeah. Bob was here and while I've been here. So they go they go back go back a long ways. I okay. I believe the one through five to be select board procedures. Um, you know, in the top two paragraphs being you know actual language from the donations uh, original yeah. Um, yeah. donations. Yeah. I don't have a year as to when those five were put together but in some informal conversations with other select board members that may date back to the 80s um, this doesn't seem to fall too far from the from the tree uh, Gordon you attended uh, Stephen Taylor's talk about the four farms uh, the yeah. board. Um, uh, just to add some levity um, Mr. Taylor mentioned that some towns had a solution for, for this, and Gordon helped me with this, um, that they would take the person that was in need and just deliver them to the town, the next town down, and leave them at the town hall. Um, and that became a he, he, he I, I, I think he did say, I think he did say that. Yeah. I, there wasn't much humanity in some of the, right. Right. Some of the things that used to happen. Yeah, uh, I think I only bring that up because um, there is a rich history for all the towns, including Heartland, um, with the four farms, and and uh, and I'm glad we have the Mary Campbell Fund to continue that spirit. Um, Dave, if I, um, I actually had some text messages this morning from people saying you're getting a caseworker. What is that all about? So I. Pretty carefully reread everything that Dave sent out, except for the 60 pages of <laughs> um, And I think what's clear is that we have a small number of cases, eight over the two years, um, that um, that we're talking about keeping the process pretty much the same. And what I'm hearing is going to be the same is that. The flow of the request is either going to come from the requester or from one of the churches or the Christmas project. Um, 
that Dave, you're going to sort of do that initial question and answer and, and a, appraisal, and if possible, use existing agencies. Um, and when it's appropriate, go direct to ourselves as the select board for, uh, for the request, much like you just outlined three. So the change is pretty subtle that of those eight, um, there's maybe one that you cited, maybe more, um, that would need this uh, per caseworker. Um, so I agree that it looks like it's a refinement of the plan and more or less reflecting um, that that movement away from the poor farm to the state aid to the nonprofits, and now we're in this world where we can actually um, help the individual that's the requester um, with just more than just um, new tires. So, yeah, thank you for clarifying that because it's not getting a caseworker for each and every time that's going to have a need pop up. Um, and it's not a limiting our role. Our role is still very big in here. Phil, I'm, I'm just going to add to that and to clarify for the board, because I think there's been some um, confusion on this as well. Um, and I'm not sure historically how much this has occurred, but I do, you know, there is a bit of a screening process when they come to me. And so I think people need to understand that the Mayor Campbell Fund doesn't, you know, we probably, we get more requests than those eight. Um, you know, those are eight that went to the select board and then there was some serious discussion on dispersing funds depending on their situation. Um, I will get, you know, I'll pick a real easy one and I just had this last week uh, of a person uh, inquiring about, you know, fuel assistance. Um, and there are literally five agencies, um, if not more, it's a very, very basic state and federal you know, program, you know, through, you know, almost everybody, if you need heating assistance. So, you know, I'm, I'm you know, it's kind of a red flag goes up and, and of those eight, we've actually got a couple fuel assistance. Um, although in some certain circumstances, you know, they were kind of falling through the cracks, but, um, you know, kind of a red flag goes up if they're calling the town for fuel assistance, um, you know, what, you know, we shouldn't be the go-to entity for fuel assistance. There's just so much out there for fuel assistance, depending on what your economic situation is, which means you need to, you know, provide financial information and stuff, uh, including an emergency service. And this person was like, well, I'm down to a quarter of tank. Um, you know, but the more I asked the questions, you know, the person was working with economic services on a White River Junction. And then, you know, it, you kind of pose, you know, well, is, have you spoken to SEPCA? Are they involved? It went, well, I happen to be talking to them tomorrow. You know, so it's kind of like, okay, you know, so, you know, those are the, the folks that you should be talking to about fuel assistance. So, you know, I don't completely shut the door. I said, speak to them. And if, you know, there's an issue or you don't get to where you need to go, give me a call and we can talk more. But and I haven't heard from this person. So, um, you know, there's been other instances of discussions where, you know, one of those boxes is just kind of glaringly obvious. And, and that's the box they need to be going to. And so they may not even get to the point of me telling them to write a letter to the select board, you know, you should be talking to so-and-so, writing a letter to the select board, sitting, you know, with a select board member and having them spend time during a meeting is kind of, you know, like cycling in first gear, you know, it's kind of a waste of time and, and um, you know, a, a payment that we don't necessarily need to make because there's a whole system already in place. We don't need to duplicate that. Uh, so I think, Phil, it's important we get the town, you know, not only are we not talking about offering social services to everybody, you know, the select board, you know, there's people that come and they're directed towards social services out that's already existing. 
um, you know, when it gets a little bit more complex than that, then it comes to the select board and it's like, okay, you know, what do you want to do with this? So there is, I do spend some time and I'm not sure, I just want to clarify that with the select board that someone may be redirected to another spot. Um, but, you know, it's generally if, you know, you can't get an answer, you know, come back and there are times where they don't come back, their, their problem is solved. So we're actually talking about a little bit, you know, so they go through that process and then we may have people that come to the select board and it may be pretty clear cut. It's a Merrick Campbell fund thing. Um, and then it's probably even a smaller percentage than that. Again, that just doesn't fit that box out there. And I, you know, it seems to me almost fitting and in line with the Merrick Campbell fund that you kind of take an extra step and say, okay, you know, let's try and, you know, get you some extra help here. So you're not coming back to us time and time again. And Phil, I would almost say, you know, a response to that is, is, you know, okay, do you want us to keep paying? You know, we've got people that call us, you know, twice a year. Um, you know, do you want us to keep funneling something to them twice a year? Or do you want us to take some time and actually get them set up so that they're not? which is kind of what we struggle during these meetings. It's like, you know, are we going to see them again for six months from now? Yeah, it's been my memory that we have very few repeat requests. I don't know if that, if anybody else has a thought about that, but I know it's often mentioned, but I don't remember very often that uh, people come back again. I think we needed to cut one payment in half because of that particular reason. I, I have an observation from the stuff that Dave sent us today. Um, from June 30th, 2019 to June 30th, 2020, um, those two funds combined grew six thousand dollars. So I don't think it should be. We shouldn't have as a goal to spin down those funds. Of course not. Like there are real reasons to help them grow, increase their endowment, so that services can be provided in emergencies, for instance, and things like that. But also, I don't think as a board, I don't think it's in in line with the um, the statements at, at the donation for us to be seeking to grow the fund either. So I don't I don't think I've, by that I don't. Oh, so we should just spend a bunch of money. By that, what I mean is that I think given the the impact this would have on the fund, it doesn't appear to me that it would shrink the fund. And that would definitely be in line with the statements by the manager and the Campbell uh, when they donated this month. Uh, is Martin still with us? Dave, is Martin Dole still with us? Yes. Cheers. Martin, I have a question. You're probably on mute, Martha. Not Martha, Martin. Oh, Wait. Martin. He, Martin. He's, still, he's still with us, Gordon. What's the question? He just wrote uh, into the chat. <laughs> I, I just wonder what um, the numbers that appear on the the six thousand um, dollar. I I just wonder how those are invested, because if that that may or may not be a real gain. So Gordon, Gordon, I can answer that. Martin, okay. I'm all right with that. So it's invested in two places. So it's invested in um, uh, a CD. Partially, you know, it's partially invested in a CD. And it's partially invested in simply our savings account. And up until about June, July, um, with 
the pandemic and something, some of the things that's happening economically, uh, our savings account was kind of thumping um, the CD as far as an interest rate goes. Uh, and that's, that's real interest. Um, so okay, that, that answers my question. Because yeah. it, it's, not, um, it's not a market thing that can go up and down. This is, this is real, real gains. Well, this, the, the CD obviously, you know, but it's, well, the CD yeah. is so darn conservative. Um, you know, yeah. it's, and, um, and it's getting, and it's really bad now. Can he, I mean, you get a, almost nothing at this point. Okay. That answers my question. Yep. So I, um, <laughs> thinking about, what that was. Thinking about um, what you said, Dave, and what you said, Phil, um, I wonder if it isn't um, a pretty good idea to get that letter, if possible, even at some times when we find other sources, because it might be worth, um, they still might need help. in a non-monetary way. I don't know if I can explain this quite what I'm trying to say, but just because we find another service to direct them to doesn't mean that their problem is going to go away. Maybe maybe our role could be if if we are successful with a per diem counselor that that could be applied to people um, for the benefit of because they're Heartland residents um, even though we aren't giving them money. Does that make any sense? To me Gordon that makes perfect sense that sounds wonderful and, and I was thinking that maybe not initially and maybe not as a goal, but one of the ways that this program could grow is by offering services, these services to people more generally, you know, not to not to deplete the fund, but those 16 requests that Dave gets that he only forwards on eight of us, eight to us, maybe some portion of them could also benefit from such a thing. That's yeah. That's what you're saying, right, well, Gordon? I'm, yeah, I'm not looking to solve every problem in Heartland, but I'm just saying yeah. that once in a while, it, it might be obvious that even though they've got, we've got them off our back, that uh, we still might want to think a little serious about. Gordon, Gordon, I don't know if it's necessarily get them off our back, but I, I'm not entirely sure that, you know, having someone write a letter and involving uh, a person simply for say heating oil um you know if you want to put that layer in that's fine um but you know i think that's um you know a little redundant when they can turn around and speak to the folks um with the heating oil um you know particularly if it's per diem but you know if you want to go to that depths um i uh, you know you can you know they can you can forward well, the letter to them, but you know, it's, I'm just, you know, Dave, I, Dave, I think I'm thinking of problems worse than needing a hundred gallons of oil. What's that? I think I'm thinking of problems that generally would be generally worse than needing oil. All right, Gordon, if I understand, um, if the, the role of the Mount of Scutney case worker, um, they, they, don't lose track of that person. They keep track of that person yeah. and make sure that they receive the services. Um, so I, I, I found myself just thinking um, a couple of thoughts. One, um, we should start small. You know, I, I don't think we we're talking about having a town nurse like Lyme does, or aging and Heartland nurses. Um, we're, we're not we're not there yet. Um, you know, even though Agent and Heartland's you know, targets a different, does not target the entire community. Um, 
so we're, we are, if we start small and just try to to tackle um, that, that, that those cases that don't fit into the system today, then I would be very interested. Um, you know, if we have a per diem caseworker, I would hope they we would get a report from them just to sort of say, this is what we're doing. You know, um, uh, I, for HIPAA reasons, I don't know how much we could get or can't get, but um, yeah. so it's, I, I, I don't know. I guess my message is I, 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 I like this additional layer of helping. Um, I want to be conservative with how we talk about starting it. Uh, and I want to have, you know, make sure we look at it going going down the line. One of the things you said, Phil, about, you know, I would hope we would get a report. Um, the research I read about contracting for services like, like this, um, they said the most important thing for having positive outcomes for the people and for the agency, which would be us in this case, is having um, really clear, well thought out contracts. So all of those things like getting a report about it, all of those things, would it would be incumbent upon us to can consider those what we want, what we would consider a complete um, service, and then put those into the contract. And we would have that opportunity, yeah. And we could look at the agent and Harlan nurses because they are contractually um, you know, the area nurses have have HIPAA guidelines uh, and they have to sort of sign those privacy. Uh, there are reports that come back to the subcommittee called Cares and Concerns. Um, so I think there's some models out there right in our own backyard that we could look at. OK, I think we're, we're probably ready for a motion from somebody if it could be formulated. I think you've got the right idea still. You, you, could you give a shot? Um, well, let me, before I do, um, might, might we make a motion that we form a small group subset of ourselves to kind of try to hammer out what we're talking about and then come back? Um, Another time. Yeah. That might, that might be. I mean, I can re I can make the motion again that I made at our last select board meeting, which was essentially that. Yeah, I, I, so then the idea is to spirit is that we do want to move forward and we're going to create a plan and then we can vote separately to implement the plan. Well, I would be happy to offer that motion again, Gordon. Mm -hmm. Um, let's hear from Dave one more time. Do you think that's the way to go, Dave? Committee? Um, yeah, I think that in my mind, the most important piece here is kind of um, putting, you know, who's available and, and maybe what direction we kind of want to go to for, you know, that, that might be able to do this. And you know, again, I, it's kind of a because none of these people have been are aware that they may be asked to do something. You know, it's kind of a almost an executive session discussion. So if you know a subgroup of us was involved and did some legwork as to who might be interested in doing this, um, that would probably be a pretty good way to go um, before for maybe a, a fine, you know, a, a fuller discussion, um, you know, and maybe in the interim, there could be some discussions made with certain people and, and um, you know, a little bit of discussion as to what we would like these individuals to do precisely. And then, you know, with some of those details hammered out, I think that it would be better suited for uh, an open discussion. So I think that that's probably, um, Probably a pretty decent way to proceed, Gordon. Um, okay. Yeah, and I I would add that this group ought to just wrestle with uh, 
what a budget might look like. What what would the impact on the Mayor Campbell Fund be? You know, uh, and, and just so that we, you know, we know going in what we're hoping to come, you know, come out with. Sure. Okay, Curtis. Um, so I would move that we establish a subcommittee composed of two select board members, the town manager, and, ex and an experienced citizen to explore adding contracted case management to the services paid for by the Merrick Campbell funds. I'll second that. Any more discussion on that? I'm going to say that uh, probably every citizen is experienced, but I'll let it go. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Well, I mean, we actually particularly blessed to have some citizens who are especially experienced, like one who is on the call tonight, uh, like Sarah Cope. Okay. At that. Just uh, Curtis, Martha wants to say something. I w I'd like okay. you to just run through that motion one more time. You yeah, said and uh, I, I establish a subcommittee two board of select people the town manager and an experienced citizen to explore i let me um actually i'll just put it in the chat oh. so while while curtis is doing that um uh there was a response or something on the chat that um did basically say that absolutely conventional professional type reports that can be written that protect confidentiality and identity and still communicate the work that was done and services provided. Uh, and it's very similar to those nursing reports. So basically confirming Curtis that and and maybe Gordon, what you were kind of looking for is capable of being provided. Did you see that, Martha, in the chat? Martha. Martha's, Martha's muted. OK, I'm not muted. I see it. I'm typing it, and it sounds good. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Mm -mm. Okay, all in favor? Mary says aye. Bill says aye. I say aye, but I'm still typing it. Okay. <laughs> it's a <laughs> motion, Curtis. All right. I could have left out the details about how the committee is composed, but then two weeks from now, we'd be talking about how the com committee's com composed. Did, did so. someone second that motion? Phil did. Uh, yep. Thank you. And uh, who's going to do this? I am happy to volunteer to take the lead on it. <laughs> I'll volunteer. Yeah. Okay. So, although I, I'm not sure I can use words like, um, I still don't know how to pronounce it, uh, to relieve distress and succor worthy citizens. Yeah. I did we will succor. succor all our worthy citizens. What's that? My, it, um, it, it means to aid or something or rather. Yeah. I did. Uh, <laughs> Mary, can you uh, define that? Yeah, no, he just did it. it it's to give aid. It, it's like to, uh, it, to me, it means more like to bring health, like to help cure somebody. It's it's more medically related, to, in my mind. Okay. Martha may have a different opinion. <laughs> no, that sounds good. <laughs> um, okay. I realized that I never asked if there were any public comments. 
We may have a citizen out there in distress and we don't even know it. <laughs> right. So if there is somebody out there that has some burning thing that they wanted to get in here, this is the moment. Okay, that's good. I didn't think there would be. All right, so we should move along. We can do that. Approve this uh, Green Mountain Power request thing. End of the road. So I'd like to think that, you know, there's this newfound love affair with Green Mountain Power, and, you know, they're going to come check in with us all the time, but uh, I'm not, not sure we're there. Um, you know, the statute clearly gives them the ability to work uh, within a town right away, provided they don't hinder the maintenance uh, operations of the, the municipality. Uh, in this case, they want to basically cut through our road um, with a utility line underneath. Uh, so clearly there's the possibility that they may impede on our ability to maintain the road. Um, that coupled with the Baron Hill conversation um, that I've had with a couple of these folks probably brought them to the forefront. Um, but certainly the fact that they're cutting through a road is, is an issue. Um, and it is even more so the more that we trench or, or we do the ditching uh, alongside of the road. So the depth of the utility cable is important here um, because the, the ditch, um, you know, can be, you know, anywhere from two to four and a half feet in places, depending on what's going on. Um, so that is very important um, that we be able to maintain that. So um, it's kind of hold on right there. You're you just confused me. You're talking about the depth of the Green Mountain Power sleeve or conduit versus the town uh, uh, ditching that we really need to do for, for the standards of the state. So why this standard is important and probably why they came to see us, particularly on this issue, is because it is on a steep hill and there is a ditch line there. Okay. Uh, is our ability to maintain this road. Um, they originally came and said, yeah, they gave me a standard of like three and a half feet, uh, you know, and then it comes up to, you know, that was at the base and then you've got like a foot. So you have like three and a half to two and a half, you know, and then a foot above that, you have the marker telling you that there's a cable there. So clearly that's problematic for us. Um, so we, we, Anyway, they in this particular instance, they have done the right thing. They've come and said, look, we want to do this. Um, we're looking for your approval. I've spent time with them, uh, with Dan Austin. And um, this is, um, I was able to say no to three and a half feet and give that, you know, come up. I basically checked with um, Gordon and, and Phil. You may remember Todd Eaton, uh, checked in with him. And um, also checked in with uh, District 4 uh, over uh, Agency of Transportation and White River Junction and said, hey, what is your standard? Um, and what I got back was what I put in your packet is there's a standard, you know, VAOT standard D20, which basically the state asked the utilities to bury it essentially five feet under the road surface. Um, and if you bury it five feet under the road surface, the trench is on average about two and a half feet. So that gives us a whole other two and a half feet before you hit the utility line. So it gives us room to do some ditching on the side. So the five foot depth is, is you know, good. So that's what we asked for. Uh, they agreed to that. Um, the only difference between what I put in your packet um, Green Mountain Power and I had some, some subsequent discussion. Um, in the original packet, we talked about a concrete casing. Uh, we decided, uh, you know, that a steel conduit or basically a steel sleeve would be acceptable. And I obviously recommend this to the select board simply because, um, you know, we're getting into 
um, cold weather. Um, also, in order to do the cement, they would have to leave. There's not many people on Garcia Lane, but we'd have to close the entire road for, you know, upwards to six or more hours. Um, and that would essentially cut those four houses off from, from Mount Hunger. So that really wasn't optimal. They can keep one lane open if they do the steel sleeve. Um, you know, state standard, you know, is, gives a thumbs up to either one. So um, in the discussions, I found um, the five foot depth, and actually they're going to do more than five feet under the road surface and uh, a steel sleeve to be um, good. And I would um, recommend to the select board that we um, grant that approval to Green Mountain Power. Dave, was there any discussion of the possibility of boring through? That's just too expensive. Uh, there, it was, um, there's a little bit of a timing, you know, I blame this on a little bit on Green Mountain Power and the actual applicant, but, um, you know, I think that if it were maybe a busier road, I think I would have stood hard on the boring, but, um, things are kind of, you know, we've even talked about this as far as, uh, the lawyers that we use, the, the property transactions and, and, uh, the contracting busy business is pretty crazy right now, and um, they need to have this done. Basically, Green Mountain Power ceases underground utility burial as of December 1st uh, until the end of next spring. So uh, in the goodness of working together and getting this done um, for the, the applicant there, um, trenching I think will be, will be fine. But we did talk about boring, and I think that we should – consider the boring um, if they come to us for future prospects. I'm, not, I'm, Cert not uh, I'm sorry, Phil, certainly if it's pavement, um, absolutely if it's pavement, you know, digging up and trenching through the pavement and then repaying it over is, is somewhat substandard sometimes. This is a dirt road, uh, hard pack, and, um, you know, I think that, um, I think it's more than, more than fine. I think my only concern would be, uh, can they get the depth that we're, they're, they're promising to get? Uh, uh, I, I think they can. Okay. Uh, um, you know, we're not accustomed to doing this, but uh, there's no shame on Bill taking a ride out there and making sure they get to the depth that they need to be. Um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, Gordon, I'm comfortable with it if if if, yeah. if we have a just that sort of check and balance that we actually before they put fill it in that we know it's at the depth that they say it's going to be. I'll just sorry, Gordon, you may hop in here, but I'll just say that this is um, a vast improvement. Our our experience with VTEL is is less than favorable. Um, you know, they buried cable throughout the town, and um, if we're out raking leaves, we may dig up that cable. I mean, it's literally a couple inches under the ground, and it's a problem almost everywhere we go. Yeah. Um, so if we can start on the, this path, I think it's, it's, a, it's a positive step. All right. Okay, need a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve Green Mountain Power putting in a standard D20 sleeve to cross Garcia Lane at the Fortuno residence, or whatever you pronounce their last name. Fort Fort Fortunato, yeah. Fortunato. Yep. I would just call it a, a steel sleeve, Phil. Okay. And not go after the standard? Uh, uh, well, the standard gives at least two options. So I would just say that uh, the steel, utilizing a steel sleeve or a steel conduit will be fine. Mark, I'm okay with that if that's. Yeah. 
need a second. I'll second. This is Mary. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Dave, we do we all need to sign this? Uh, actually, I can sign it. Uh, it says or authorized representative. Okay. I do need you to sign the uh, the Cheryl one though, Gordon, tomorrow. Yeah, I see okay. that. Uh, I will do that. Is there a big rush on that? Uh, only that. Um, yeah, it doesn't need to be out at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, but you know, sometime this week we want to get the um echoes with the bond application, so we kind of want to get that in. All right, it won't be tomorrow then, but I'll, okay, it, it will be the next day or the day after that. I will, I'll do it, try to do it. Okay. Wednesday. We yeah. know where to find you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be passing through, okay, you're good. So we're, we're down to uh, the manager's notes. Has everyone read the manager's notes? Yes. Dave, is there anything sticking out that you have to talk talk about? We need to uh, yeah, I just want to, um, I get a fair amount of emails or phone calls on the Mace Hill project. Um, so I'd just like to kind of hit on that. Um, okay. We did. We didn't hit a snag, uh, although now it's excavating hit a snag uh, with the uh, culverts. They were um, kind of a special order thing, according to specs. Uh, you know, almost like a Christmas present from, you know, in the mail. Um, they got some pieces and not the other pieces. So um, we needed to, knots uh, needed to work through that. Um, there was a prospect that they, we're maybe going to need to improvise and, um, um, you know, lay some cement um, with a cast, but um, they were able to solve their problems with the manufacturer. Uh, so that's been um, alleviated. Uh, Knotts was um, working with the manufacturer, so it was kind of a direct relationship between the excavator and the manufacturer. It wasn't uh, wasn't on us, so it was on knots. So anything that they need to work out will need to be worked out between the two of them. Uh, however, we should be back on um, schedule here. Um, the engineer, our engineer, was hoping that perhaps by the end of the week that could be wrapped up. They'll still need to pave, but um, the actual culvert work um, and um, having it covered up and drivable anyways um, was hoped to be by Friday afternoon. Um, we'll have to wait to see if they can hold that. Weather um, is a little shaky right now, but um, that's the goal. One other thing I'll hit real quick is, um, as Rob uh, Sangster kind of pointed out, we did hear from the uh, energy person that was doing the audit for Damon Hall and the rec center. Um, he did finally pull his uh, head above water and responded to us. Um, and um, about the same point in time, uh, we did hear from Kevin O'Toole, uh, the person that had been working on our delinquent tax sale. Kevin O'Toole apparently now has a, an assistant. So he is going to come in and try and finish that up. Uh, in the meantime, Jim Barlow, um, who we have worked with, uh, did say that he would have done the um, tax sale. I think going forward, um, Kevin has always kind of hinted that we're on the fringe of his territory and um, he may not do this for us forever. So I think that, um, you know, if we need to move to Jim Barlow, it won't be a surprise to us mm -hmm. at some point. But Kevin did say he'd be here this week and um, we should be able to hopefully get that moving again. So that does that mean that that will happen this this early winter rather than spring? Uh, it should be happening. Uh, the only 
The only problem we're kind of bumping up with, um, it's kind of a sensitivity thing. We got kind of the holidays here, so it's kind of a cruddy thing to be doing in the holidays. So we'll maybe need to kind of, I'll need to talk about that a little bit with Kevin, but um, you know, we should be able to move forward with that. I think that um, the timing may be a little sensitive, but um, we'll, I'll talk to Kevin and see how we go there. Okay. All right, thank you, Dave. So I think we've hit everything on the agenda except our executive session. Oh, I forgot about that. So, uh, Martha, you have the words. Uh, Martha, Dave, you don't have the words because Dave did not send the words. Uh -huh. <laughs> I told Martha I would have the words and I got busy with something, so I'm going to have to wing it for you guys. Um, so someone needs to uh, make the motion that you have made um, a determination that um, information, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Pre, um, I'll keep it basic, that the information is sensitive enough uh, that you feel as though it needs to be made in executive session. We I think there's it. like just the town in there or something like let's, that. Uh, Dave, let's get it in the minutes right. Okay. Um, uh, I would just it. simply that the, the, the select board make the motion that um, the information to be discussed is uh, has sensitivity to um, affect. Oh, is it is it premature knowledge or something like that? Is yes, that premature is the word I was looking for. <laughs> uh, exactly. You guys ought to have this down, honestly. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Hell, we ought to have this down, Gordon. Past listening in the background. I can hear her. <laughs> hear you guys We're listening in the foreground to Fred. She's not premature knowledge. What is she scolding us about? We should know this? Yeah, yeah. I told her that we'd have it. Uh, Hold on. Wait, the select board, after the select board finds that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the, pu the public body at a substantial disadvantage. That is it. Two parts, you have to include both parts, yes. That is it. The select board needs to make a motion finding that this that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. So moved. I'll second that. This is Mary. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 You then need to make a second motion. Uh, that basically states that um, you are you move to you move to go into executive session based upon one VSA subsection three thirteen one A and one VSA subsection three thirteen three. So moved. I'll second that. This is Mary. You got all that, Martha. No, I do not. But you I will, Martha, it's on the agenda. Will. I will. will work on it. She will. And she will it will it. be in the minutes. Sorry, Martha. My my <coughs> Okay. My all oversight. In favor. All in favor of the motion. Aye. Mary aye. Aye. Curtis aye. Okay. Session. And we have a decision on number one concerning Fort Brook. Brook Road, and so I would look for a motion from Martha. Can you read us some, what we have discussed? Yeah. I move that we further pursue an offer to purchase for $10,000 the property at 21 Fork Brook Road. Um, I'll, I'll second her. 
is there is there any possibility that's confusing that you said we <laughs> you said pursue <laughs> an offer yeah it is confusing I, I agree it it it's not clear it sounds almost like the town is is going to yeah buy it we're buying it. all right those were dave's words i know not he was wrong martha it's late he's hungry yeah all right just so calling his name pursue pursue an offer to sell maybe would solve it all right my motion is to further pursue an offer to sell the 21 fork brook road property for ten thousand dollars that isn't good either <laughs> no, <not good> <laughs> oh boy it is well, we just pursue an offer on 21 fork brook road right that's like that's the language i made an offer on okay let's try that <laughs> all right the motion is to further pursue an offer on 21 fork brook road for ten thousand dollars how's that sound better i will say yeah, that's better, better. Did you say you would second it, Curtis? Yep, I will second. All right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Curtis. Good. Okay. And as for um, articles uh, number two and three concerning uh, first concerning 142 Brownsville Road. No action was taken. Uh, it was more informational. And for number three, concerning the Rex, Rec Recreational Assistant Director candidate, there a very um, interesting discussion, but no action taken. It was uh, informational for us. Uh, in, in that case, we weren't anticipating any action anyways. So we've got does it um, does anyone have anything else to bring up tonight please god no everyone <laughs> say no I, I am curious about the wheat road piece how bad was it it's bad bad <laughs> yeah um i have a, a tiny little thing absolutely no information needed to give I've started to get information back on um, first responders response times to Heartland, including Vermont State Police, FAST, and the fire department. So when that comes up, we'll have real concrete data to talk about. Good. Right. Good. Okay. okay. Mary, just, just know that both the Vermont State Police and James have been notified of what's going on on Wheat Road. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Hello. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Have a good dinner. We need to move. <laughs> we, have adjourn. we haven't adjourned yet. Oh. Please hey, adjourn. I moved that Somebody. I'll make a motion that we adjourn the meeting of whatever day it is, November 2nd. Okay. Hallelujah. I'll we'll second, second that. Yeah. All in favor. All right. Bye. And our Very next nice. meeting is November 16th. Yes. Okay. Martha, thank you so Bye. much for well, your thank you, Dave. Thank you for assiduous tomorrow. minute taking. <laughs> Martha, what time do you Bye. work in tomorrow? 10 to 1. Uh, I'll, well, I'll see you. I'm 7 to 10, so I'll see you okay. on the way out. Bye-bye. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you guys. Bye.